Hello everyone, welcome back into the studio for another round of Sculpting from Anatomy, Knowledge and Imagination. Currently we're far through the blocking of this figure and we're getting into the more refined blocking stages where we adjust smaller issues. We still need to add or rather finish the head and forearms, but we'll get to that in this video. Let's get into it. At the beginning here, things are looking a little too out of control for my taste, and this often occurs during the blocking stage. Clarity is missing and it's tough to look at our sculpture and fully grasp what it is that we've actually sculpted. Not only in terms of what we, what we see, where is this particular muscle or what's the specific shape of this form, but it's also tough to judge with any degree of success if any of this is going to translate well into a finalized and finished sculpture. Most of the clay has been added at this point and it's not about adding much more clay everywhere, it's about making sure that what is there reads clearly. To this end, I like to use a technique that is sometimes dubbed form isolation. Form isolation simply means that you take forms present on the surface of your model or reference and isolate them in clay on your sculpture. Each form is going to have a clear outline and a clear interior, and those two things need to be separate. In drawing, we need to differentiate between lines. Some lines means or mean boundary of forms, and those lines are the outline of the body, for example, and very often those type of lines will be sudden and sharp. Some lines are meant to say something about the edge of a shadow, and these lines cannot be the same as the lines telling us about the boundary to the form. These lines are often softer and less defined as a result. They're broader, if you will. It's a language that tells the viewer or explains to the viewer what it is that they're looking at. And the same thing rings true in sculpture when using the form isolation technique. The interior of the form should look different than the outline of the form, and in doing so we'll be able to tell ourselves, able to tell for ourselves rather, and everybody else who might be looking at our work frankly, what shapes we've created with much more clarity. Form isolation works poorly or becomes too abstract, in my opinion, if there is no volume associated with the forms. Instead of volume, you could make sure that there is plane. Simply plane without volume becomes flat, of course, as well, but that can start looking rather robotic and mechanical with a bunch of sharp angles describing plane. So I think a preliminary version of the final volume to the forms help visually without being dangerous in terms of sacrificing anything such as flexibility. Form isolation works great for this early block in stage and is a great way to get a less abstract preview of what your final sculpture is going to be in a way. It's also a bit step by step, if you will, compared to more impression based methods, which makes it easier to teach, I think, and a bit easier to follow for you. And personally, I love working in this way as it's controlled, so it's usually something that I do in the technique, if you will, that I tend to stick to. For form isolation to work, the key elements are clear outline and clear interior of the forms. This means that we have to give the interior of the forms some sort of attention in terms of making it appear like a unified surface. A unified surface doesn't have to mean smooth, but we can't have multiple walls running through the middle of a form describing volume. Walls like those we used when we were building the contours, for example. Doing this is going to get too abstract, where it becomes difficult, in my opinion, to judge the work that you have in front of you. So unify the form inside the outline that you've drawn. Part of the strength of form isolation is that it always allows you that preview, a rough sneak peek at what your sculpture is going to look like, without giving up too much in terms of flexibility. The outline of the forms have to be rough and loose, so they read visually as very different compared to the interior of the forms. This way, we'll be able to separate the two visually, essentially see the difference between the outline of the form and the inside of the form when looking at our work. Usually for me, this means leaving quite a bit of space between the forms and much more depth between the forms as well, compared to what we will eventually have in, in, the, final, uh, in the final piece. This allows adjustments to the placement, the size, and the shape of the forms themselves, and it allows for an easy time transitioning forms into one another later on down the line. 
Short transitions are very hard to make soft, while longer transitions are much easier to make soft. So a little more space in between the forms help us out later in that regard. As we're slowly approaching modeling, which is not a clear step truly, it's sort of a slow or gradual transition out of the blocking stage into the modeling stage. And as we're doing so, there are certain formal elements that our form isolation technique must have, or our sculpture must have, no matter the technique, frankly, in order for us to model with any degree of confidence. Modeling is a tricky one. It's essentially how we will arrive at our final surface, and in order to do so successfully with control, we need to make sure that we're dealing with, on a conscious level, shape, plane, volume, and transition. So the formal elements of modeling, what we will be working with in order to model our piece, is going to be shape, plane, volume, and transition. It's useful for us to split them up like this so that we can control them individually to begin with, though it doesn't have to be that way forever. Shape is self-explanatory. Every form has a shape or an outline to it. We're not talking in terms of anatomy here, though. Sometimes the shapes correspond with the underlying anatomy, more times than not, in fact. But shape is more complex than that. Shape is what we see on the surface, and there can be many reasons for why certain shapes look a certain way. Different people are going to have different levels of definition, and this is going to impact shape. Some are heavier than others, and perhaps some of the shapes will be determined by this. Some shapes are more common in females, and some are more common in males. Understanding anatomy will get you really far when it comes to shapes, and the more you know, the better you will be able to see past the jumble of forms that is the human body and find something that makes sense. Study of anatomy is therefore important, and here, when working from imagination, we're going to get to test that out quite a bit. The study of reference from many different people is also vital as different builds and different people are going to offer different solutions to the shape problem. Only studying anatomy is going to lend itself, or result in, very generic looking figures. And studying real life reference is going to solve the generic issue for you. Plane is the second formal element of modeling. Each form, which we've now isolated into a shape, is going to have different planes inside of it. In addition to the overall planar structure of the figure, of course, which ideally has been organized already. Plane can be simplified into three different planes. Facing the light, facing neutral, and facing away from the light. And we're going to call this positive, neutral, and negative planes. And usually, each of these, or at least two of them, exists within each form that we've isolated. If shape is going to give you the outline to each form, plane is going to tell you something about how the form turns from the light into the shadow. Some areas on the human body are going to have all three, positive, neutral, and negative, and some don't. Perhaps they only have two. The upward facing plane of the sternum, for example, is not as clear as the ribs or around the pelvis because it only have, has positive and neutral planes and rarely any negative planes. Obviously, pose and position is going to play a big role here in what sort of planes a form has, if they're facing the light or facing away from the light, but in a fairly normal standing pose like we have here, the things that I just mentioned tend to ring true. Volume is the third formal element of modeling and it deals with how round a form is, essentially. The plane tells us something about where the form, where the form turns from light towards shadow. Volume takes us out of the mechanical realm of, or the binary realm perhaps, of a one and a zero, or a zero and a one, and starts making the forms look more organic and natural. But random volume, or a form with random volume with no consideration of plane is going to leave you in a place, or your sculpture, in a place where every form turns in a very similar way, in a very generic way, and frankly, that's just not the case when looking at real people. Some forms are going to have really large light planes and more narrow shadow planes, and for others, the opposite is going to be true. 
So first we have to understand plane and where the high point of one plane ends and another begins, often called a plane break or a plane change. And between these, so not at the breaks or not at the plane changes, but between the two plane changes, between these we add volume. And this ensures that the forms don't balloon out and become larger than what they need to be, or that they become generic. With shape and plane present, volume should be, frankly, should be pretty easy to add, though it's tough to judge how much of it you need. And it tends to end up much more complex than that when it comes to the execution of it, but we'll talk about that soon enough. The last formal element to modeling is going to be transition, which is how each form transitions into the next form, or the form next to it. We're talking about the areas between the forms where we're currently leaving more space and more depth than we will eventually need. Transition is the last formal element because without the other three properly established, especially plane and volume, your forms will disappear when you add transition and you will have to find them again, which is a waste of time. They will by default become more obscure when you add transitions, but they shouldn't be completely lost. If you add transition and your work becomes flat, it's usually because you didn't dedicate enough time to dealing with planes and volume. So it's all interconnected and it relies upon one another. The order is as such because it's going to be the most effective way with the least back and forth that you can possibly manage if you follow the order that I just laid out. Having said that, there is always some back and forth, so don't worry if you find yourself in a place where that does occur. When you understand the formal elements of modeling, you understand the game that we're trying to play, and you can look at your reference and your work through this lens and hopefully make some sense of what it is that you're looking at and what it is that you're trying to accomplish.